Hey you guys, I'm back once again with another book review. Going a little bit more recent this week. This one is from 2018 and it is called The Nightmare Room by Chris Sorensen. This was another one that I saw recommended a lot, got a uh, really lot of good reviews on Goodreads and uh, various things. So I was really kind of excited to read this one, ordered it off Amazon. It's been in the pile for a while and I finally got around to reading it. And I will say, this was a really good book. I mean, this was one of those books where I basically, I sat down like one evening to read it and without even like realizing it or straining myself or anything like that, I was like almost all the way through the book, like in one sitting, which doesn't usually happen because usually other stuff interrupts and I have it, but I just got like so sucked into the story that I had read almost the entire book without even really realizing it. Like it's a very, very easy read. So uh, this is actually Chris Sorensen's first novel. I guess he's better known as an audiobook narrator. Um, he's narrated over 200 audiobooks and has won several awards, uh, you know, for doing that. And he is also, um, from my understanding, a playwright and a screenwriter and has had a lot of his stuff produced. But this is actually his first novel novel. Now, the cool thing about this is that, you know, everybody says write about what you know and stuff like that. So obviously that's what Chris Sorensen did because the protagonist or one of the protagonists of this story is also an audiobook narrator. But it's not, it's cool because it has like enough of details like about his job and things like that and some things you know when he's recording like weird shit comes out on the recording so it does kind of like play into how the story goes so I thought that was really cool but it didn't get really bogged down in technical issues or anything it was just kind of like a background thing that sort of enhanced the stuff that was going on in the house and I liked that as well. So basically, this is a haunted house story. Now, if I didn't mention it before, this also, um, I think the Indie Book Awards, I think this won like best first novel of the year. And it's won like some other, it's been on like a lot of top 10 or top, you know, lists for 2018. And like I said, I can certainly see why. It's a haunted house novel. And, you know, when I talk about the setup, it doesn't sound like all that original, but I just really, really like what was done with it. And I just really, really liked the characterization. So basically the story is this. There's a guy named Peter Larson, he, who is an audiobook narrator. That's his job. And he has a wife named Hannah. Now, at some point before the events of the book have taken place, they have lost their son, Michael, to cancer. So they're basically trying to make a new start in life. So they're moving from the big city back to this tiny little town. It's like a little college town uh, called Maple City. I believe it's in Illinois where Peter grew up and where his parents still live because it so happens that I don't, I didn't get like a clear sense of how long ago Michael had died, but I think it was, it was probably like a significant portion of time because they weren't still like in full on grieving mode. They were just kind of, you know, trying to get on with it, trying to, you know, put their lives back together. So I assume it had been like a little while. So it so happened that Peter's dad, um, who's called Big Bear, is actually dying or he's not doing too well. And he had to get moved to um, a long-term care facility um, because he's showing signs of dementia and whatnot. So Peter and Hannah pretty much pack up their entire lives, go back to this little college town, and they assume from what someone at the real estate office or the lawyer or whatever told them that they would be allowed to move into... Peter's parents' house because they're both in care now, you know, and he just assumed and they said, yeah, that's what, that's what you do. So they get there with all their stuff, like after driving all this way. And then the other lawyer or whoever it was, like the, you know, the more authority person comes in and be like, oh, no, no, no. Um, this house actually has to be sold to pay for the long-term care of your dad and also his mom, Myrna, who was all, who was abusive and she also has dementia and doesn't remember him. And um, they're both in the same care facility now. So basically they're like, well, we need to sell the house to pay for the, you know, to pay for the facility. So you can't stay here. And we've also had it, the college that is in the town has been expanding and they want the property. So they're going to buy the house. So basically, Peter and Hannah were like, well, shit, now what are we going to do? But then it comes to pass that the person at the office that told them that they could move into the house in Maple City was not entirely wrong. 
It was just that Peter's dad, Big Bear, had actually bought like this kind of rundown old farmhouse, like out past the, you know, limits of the town or whatever. And he had been renting it out to, you know, workers and anybody that needed to stay there. And Peter didn't know about it. So that was actually the house that they were referring to. That was the house that they were allowed to stay. And they said, you can rent it for a dollar if you want to buy it later on, you can do that. So they had it kind of all set up. Uh, in that regard, they had just got the wrong house. So Peter and Hannah, you know, go to this farmhouse, which it's not like a complete dump, but it needs a lot of work. Now, Peter is just kind of like, man, you know, fuck my life or whatever. But Hannah, his wife, who's actually like a kind of cool character, she's kind of like a you know, like a Def Leppard kind of listening girl, because she reminded me like, I kind of pictured her in my head, like, Maybe I kind of pictured the the family, like the family from The Devil's Candy, that movie, if you've seen that one, because they're like kind of heavy metal, gothy kind of people. Or maybe like Mandy, like the character of Mandy from the movie Mandy with Nicolas Cage. That's kind of who she reminded me of. That's like the vibe she gave off. So she like sees this house and she's very, very excited. And she's just kind of like, oh man, we can fix this all up. We can do this, that, and the other thing. And he's like, well, you know, she's trying to get past the grief of like losing their son and everything. So he's like, okay, well, we'll stay here, even though it's not ideal. So it turns out though, that when he goes down into the creepy, creepy basement, he's like, hey, um, it's almost kind of like naturally soundproof down here. So this is where I'm going to put my audio booth where I can record my audiobook so I can work down here. And um, that's actually what ends up happening. However, as in most haunted house stories, shit don't go too well. Like shit starts going awry. She, he starts hearing like weird stuff on some of his recordings, like weird audio glitches. And um, as the story goes on, like the haunting or whatever it is, seems to be ramping up. Now, the interesting thing about this too, and when the book starts, like almost like a prologue, they're actually talking about a little boy who was trying to escape from his abusive dad. And he goes down, like, I guess he gets scared and he like wets the bed and his dad is like a giant gaping anus and drags the poor little kid down to the basement and locks him down in there. And there's like a room down in the basement, which the little kid, you know, kind of thinks of as the nightmare room, because every time he has a nightmare and starts screaming and wakes his dad up, you know, he gets dragged down to the basement and like thrown in there. You know, even in the very beginning of the book, there's some shit about like the little kid and there's like an, some kind of entity that's down there that talks to him. Um, he's known as Whisper or he's known as Mr. Tell. And um, you're not really sure like if the if the entity, I mean, you know, it's probably real because, you know, it's a haunted house horror novel and it'd be kind of lame if it wasn't. But you don't really know, like, the parameters of what this entity is or what it wants or anything like that. So, interestingly, this story, like, with the little boy and the thing in the basement and the nightmare room that's in the basement that the little boy stays in where he tries to, like, keep himself safe from this entity that's down there that starts to tie in with the modern day story. Now, I'm not going to spoil how it does. I mean, I think I said on my Woman in Black review that I'm not going to be quite as worried about spoiling things um, just so I can talk about things a little bit more freely. That said, though, you know, I spoiled a lot of stuff on the Woman in Black review, but that's because that book came out in 1983 and there's been like a whole bunch of movie adaptations about it. So I kind of figured that everybody sort of knew like at least the bones of the story. So I didn't really feel that bad about spoiling it. This book is still pretty recent. It's only about two years old. So I'm not gonna spoil like exactly what the entity is or exactly how the entity is tied to the modern day and tied to Peter because there is like a connection there. But I will say that it does definitely have something to do with the past with the guy, like with um, something that happened at the house that he forgot about, um, something to do with memory, uh, you know, memories that were taken away from him, I guess. And also something that he did in the more present day that he forgot about, but not, it wasn't his choice to forget about it. Let's put it that way. So it's interesting because this isn't, as I said, it's a haunted house story, but it's not a traditional haunted house story because this thing that's in this house is not really 
a ghost. It's like, it's not really a demon or anything like that. It's just this weird kind of shadowy entity that has like particular powers. And I'm not even sure. I mean, I guess it's like a bad guy, but I guess it's kind of like ambiguous because it seemed to do good shit. And there was something to do with like the mom and there was all kind of stuff going on in there. So it's kind of like a really intricate, like fascinating entity that's been created in this book. Uh, another thing too, is that this apparently, this is the first of um, a series, a purported series. I don't know how many it's going to be. So this is the first book. The series is called the Messy Man series. Um, and I'm assuming, I think the Messy Man is what the entity is called. Now the second book called The Hungry Ones is already out. Um, I haven't read it yet, but as much as I like this one, I'm sure I probably will get around to it. So I don't know if it's going to be um, concerned with Peter and Hannah, um, you know, if, if it's going to be concerned with that family or if, you know, the entity is going to move on to someone else or it's going to be like in the same farmhouse. I'm not really sure like how it's going to go, but I'll definitely like read the second one in the series, you know, eventually when I get through my pile, I'll review that one too and we'll see like what we had going on with this one. But yeah, it's like, this is, as I said, I mean, for somebody that, I mean, I know he's not you know, he, he wrote plays, he's written screenplays and stuff like that. So it's not like he's a complete novice writer or anything. And also he, you know, narrates audiobooks. So this is someone that for their first novel, you know, this is a really easy read. It's like, it's very easy to get just sucked into the story almost immediately. I almost felt like I kind of like phased out but because I was so involved in the story. And then I was like, holy shit, there's only like 30 pages left. Like, and it's not, you know, it's not a long book, but it's not like super short either. I think it's like something like it's 250, 200 something like that. How many pages is this? Let's check. Let's check. This is, it's 263 pages. So yeah, and I, and I read it like in a couple of hours, like in one sitting without even meaning to. So that should say something about how kind of compelling and how, you know, intriguing the story is because I just kept wanting to read it and see what was happening um, because it's just like this mystery. You're not sure what the entity is. And another thing too, is that even though I've seen most of the reviews I've seen of this have been like very, very positive, um, which I would agree with the negative reviews that I saw, basically one of the main criticisms was, oh, well, it takes too long in the buildup, you know, all the character work. It was, you know, it took too long to get to the scary stuff, but I'm not really sure I agree with that. I mean, it's kind of hard for me to say because I read it very quickly. So to me, it seemed like, oh, here's all the spooky shit, like already, because I was just sitting there reading it and it took like a couple of hours. So to me, it didn't really seem like the buildup was all that slow. I mean, right out the gate, you have this prologue about this little boy and his horrible abusive dad and some kind of entity. And you're not really sure what's going on there. So already you have that. And then yes, you have like a character buildup with this family and you kind of get a sense of Peter and Hannah's relationship, which is actually like a really good, I really like the interplay between the two of them. They're very um, relatable characters. It was kind of like working class kind of, um, you know, just working stiff kind of characters. Like Hannah, she tries, when they move to the town, she tries to go get in, like an administrative assistant job, like at the college, but she can't get it. So she ends up being a bartender, which she did back when she was younger. Um, and there's like a couple funny scenes with that. And also like the, the bartender, that hires her or the, or the bar manager that hires her rather is like also an old high school friend of Peter's. So like the interaction between the three of them is just like really funny and it's like, you know, very naturalistic. So you can really kind of get into these characters worlds. You know, they, none of them are annoying. None of them do stupid things. None of them, you know, they're just like regular ass people and they're put into this situation. And there's also some cool shit too, where Peter is kind of like the only one that really, experiences any of the stuff to any great degree at first. And so he's kind of in a position where he doesn't want to put more burden on his wife, um, you know, because she's still going through the trauma of like losing the son and everything. But at the same time, you know, the crazy shit that's happening is kind of making it look like he's losing his marbles. So there's kind of like kind of a lot of stress, but I do like that it didn't really put a damper on their relationship so much as, you know, as it kind of brings them stronger together, which I think is like kind of cool. You don't see that a lot. Usually it's kind of like, you know, breaks people up and they're like, you're crazy. No, you're crazy. And all this other kind of shit. So I like that even though there was a little bit of that, they still like kind of had each other's backs, even though from Hannah's perspective, it looked like Peter was like, 
losing his shit. But yeah, that said, I mean, there was a lot of hype about this book. And um, I do feel like in a large, to a large extent, that is justified. As I said, it's not reinventing the wheel or anything like that. It's a haunted house story with kind of a twist. Um, you know, like I said, it's not a ghost or anything like that, but it has like a lot of the haunted house tropes to it. So, you know, if you don't like haunted house books, I don't know if it would turn you on to them or, you know, if you'd be into it because it's not that different. But the writing of it is really cool, really compelling. It's very, very easy to get into. It's very, very easy to read. Um, you know, it's a very fast read. The character work is very good. The characters are all very fun and relatable. Um, the situation is just original enough that you know, it has kind of like a new spin on it. And also now that you know that there's a second book, the ending of it is a lot more compelling because you're like, where where's this going to go? Because now that you've introduced this entity, I'm kind of curious to see where it's going to end up going in the future. So yeah, I mean, if you're into haunted house books, which I am, it's probably my favorite subgenre of horror is haunted house novels. I know there's a lot of them and a lot of them are very samey, like I get that, but I don't know. There's just something about haunted house novels that I really, really like. And um, this is definitely a really, really good one. One of the best ones uh, I've read recently. So I would definitely recommend it if you're into that kind of thing. So as I said, it is The Nightmare Room by Chris Sorensen. So that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.